Welcome to Protect, suicide prevention training podcast for healthcare professionals. I'm Manan, consultant psychiatrist, founder, and head of faculty at Progress Guide. Good day. This is Mahi, your host. We're on to episode 21. We have also done six guest episodes. I am sure you've all noticed that in our academic episodes, we are sequentially covering the course content, and in the guest episodes, we draw out unique perspectives from mental health professionals and relate it back to the content in Protect. So far as guests, we've had two mental health nurses, one psychologist, one social worker, and a psychiatrist. Interestingly, in the last episode, the guests were non-mental health professionals. They were professional actors. Yes, that's correct. To role-play the case simulations in our training, we do get professional actors. And it was an opportunistic recording at the end of two days of intensive training. Tegan, Sammy, Charlie and Kira were the actors for the 7 Safe Steps program. And although they are non-mental health, they contribute so much to the course. Their real-time feedback as to how a piece of conversation made them feel is great for reinforcing those positive nuances that we are trying to establish in our dialogue. That is what creates relational safety. So you just took out your phone and recorded them at the end of the session? (laughs) Yeah, that's about it. And they were happy to play ball, so we played ball. And I thought this is great content that we should share with our listeners. In Seven Safe Steps, you all have the character Sandeep that they play. Yes, Sandeep if you're a male actor and Sandeep if you're a female actor. And what is Sandeep's story? Uh, For that, you have to come to the 7 Safe Steps training, I guess. We are meant to provide a story today, and that's Jill's story. If I delve into Sandeep, we might never get to Jill today like last time. That's true. We started episode 20 with the intention of talking about Jill, and then we got taken up with personality disorders in general and never got around to Jill. Do you want to give a quick synopsis of the three clusters before we discuss borderline personality disorder? Sure. Three clusters, ten disorders. Cluster A includes personality disorders that are characterized by odd or eccentric behavior. They tend to experience major disruptions in relationships because their behavior may be perceived as peculiar, suspicious, or detached. The three personality disorders in this group are paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. Cluster B personality disorders are characterized by dramatic or erratic behavior. They tend to either experience very intense emotions or engage in extremely impulsive, theatrical, promiscuous, or law-breaking behaviors. The most common clinical presentation is borderline personality disorder. That's uh, what it's called in the DSM-5. In the ICD-10, the same condition is called emotionally unstable personality disorder perhaps a more descriptive and maybe even a less stigmatizing name. That's what we will talk about today. The three other conditions in cluster B are antisocial, histrionic and narcissistic personality disorder. And finally, cluster C personality disorders are characterized by pervasive anxiety and or fearfulness. They are avoidant personality disorder, dependent personality disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Thank you for that summary. Just to reinforce Manan's request not to self-diagnose from the podcast or information that you read on Dr. Google, if you are concerned that you may suffer from certain unhelpful personality traits that make thinking, feeling, and relating to others difficult, please see a professional with mental health expertise. Yes, I think I mentioned it in the last episode. Uh, We all have parts of our personality that pose us difficulties and are not very pleasing. That does not mean that all of us have a personality disorder. Those with a disorder, they have significant difficulties and their traits are pervasive across time and settings. When people self-diagnose, they often have recall bias about the one or two or three instances that they may have acted in a particular way. For a diagnosis, there has to be a lifelong consistent pattern. Also, it is highly likely that those with a personality disorder may also be suffering from depression or anxiety. Treatment of those conditions may significantly help a person's psychological pain. Not to mention that sometimes a treatment for anxiety and depression, if there is a co-occurring personality disorder, may be different and not as straightforward as the treatment of anxiety and or depression on its own. 
To cut a long story short, specialist mental health opinion and expertise is invaluable. So if indicated, please use it. Let's get into it then. Borderline personality disorder. You mentioned this is the most common personality disorder in a clinical setting. Yes, it is. Maybe in prison mental health, it most probably will be antisocial personality disorder. But in the community setting, borderline personality disorder is the most common with which people present to a clinic. Around 1 in 100 people have borderline personality disorder, also called BPD in short. So it is believed to affect men and women equally, though women are far more likely to be given this diagnosis. What is the origin of the term borderline? It is called borderline because doctors previously thought that it was on the border between two different groups of disorders, neurosis and psychosis. Who coined the term? Oh dear, now you're trying my general knowledge. Well, psychiatric knowledge to be precise. (laughs) Well, it was first used in the DSM, uh, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, third edition. So that was 1980. But, But the term was used previously as well. I did a bit of research and found the name of American psychoanalyst Adolf Stern, and the year that was mentioned was 1938. Ah, so you were testing my knowledge. You knew that answer all along. Well, it's quite rare to get one over you, so I will savor the moment. I have to get on to Dr. Google to check out your research, but in all probability you are right. I'm assuming that's where you went for your research as well. Well, it was used in the 40s and 50s to describe a group of patients that did not improve with therapy and whose symptoms did not fit into either the psychosis or neurosis classifications. You have to remember that at that time, people with neurosis were believed to be treatable, whereas psychosis were thought to be untreatable. There is a term that is not used any longer called borderline schizophrenia, but I should not be confusing listeners with a history lesson. It is interesting though, because in the ICD, the term that is used is emotionally unstable personality disorder. Yes, and that is a much more descriptive term. I much prefer that actually, but I know that BPD here in Australia is used far more frequently than emotionally unstable personality disorder. Thinking about individuals and nomenclature, I think it was Otto Kernberg in the 1970s who started using the term borderline to describe a personality organization between psychosis and neurosis. People who he thought had defense mechanisms to avoid anxiety that were primitive. You know, by primitive, I mean developmentally they came first, they came early. Sorry, I don't follow. Can you give examples? You mean of the defenses? Yes. Examples include splitting. So one assigns good or bad qualities to everything, as well as projective identification or projection. So assigning your negative qualities onto someone else. Oh dear, this did not make it any easier to understand. Sorry, I guess I'm trying to explain in 30 seconds what takes mental health professionals a lifetime to get their head around. Some actually never do. So splitting is a common symptom in borderline personality disorder. Splitting means to divide something. It causes a person to view everything and everyone in black and white terms, so absolute terms. It stops them from being able to recognize or accept paradoxical qualities in someone or something and and, and it doesn't allow for any grey areas in their thinking. We are all shades of grey and ash, not black or white, but uncertainty is anxiety provoking. Some of this stems from experiences of early life traumas such as abuse and abandonment. So people with BPD may see a person as all good or all bad. There is nothing in between. So they're seeing and responding to the world in these extremes through either a filter of positivity or negativity? Yes, but in the real world as human beings, we are all fallible. But if you have been put on a pedestal as all good, when you do something wrong, that brings you crashing down. So splitting can lead to strains or fractures in their relationships? Absolutely. And interestingly, splitting happens within staff teams as well, particularly inpatient teams who are caring for a person with BPD. Some nurses will go above and beyond and become quite drawn in 
And there are others who cannot find any empathy with the person that they are supporting and actually find caring for them quite challenging and emotionally draining. So how is such splitting in staff teams addressed? Well, we may end up going at a tangent, but this may be relevant. It is essentially through the use of reflective practice and supervision that it needs to be addressed. On certain wards, the emotions may be quite overt and staff regularly use words like being manipulative, say in handovers. The reality is that the patient with BPD, they don't know the first thing about manipulation. People without BPD know how to manipulate. For example, I have been manipulated into an agreement that I will take the rubbish bins out for the rest of eternity. Not sure when I committed to that. And as a man, I would say that wives are very good at manipulating husbands into believing that something was their decision when it was only carefully implanted and extracted by their wife. And they only made it sound like the man decided this. (laughs) I'm joking, of course. Now, if this were a text, this is where I would type out LOL, laugh out loud. But on a serious note, People with borderline personality disorder do not know, as I said, the first thing about manipulation. Their distress is so high that it is visible to everyone. There is no intent to hide anything and do anything sinister. It is almost like, I cannot deal with my distress, so I intend to kill myself if you discharge me from the ward or you do not admit me. And in the making of that statement, they have managed to hand over their entire distress to you. And and then you are left dealing with it feeling quite anxious and they have managed to project their anxiety onto you as such. You said visible to everyone, but as a layperson, I can see why someone might think that such a statement is manipulative. Perhaps you're right to the untrained eye that will seem manipulative. But to the trained eye, that is an expression of distress saying, please, please help me. I cannot deal with my internal world. It is overwhelming. It's crushing me and I'm worried that I might do something that I will regret. So people do need the right skills and knowledge. And if staff have that, staff are then able to see that such behavior with which they might class, you know, they might class it as attention seeking. You know, that is really a cry for help. We spend a lot of time in our interactive exercises in the full protect training to look at these issues. Training is essential to prevent malignant alienation of certain patients, particularly on inpatient wards, but this could happen in crisis teams, emergency departments where certain patients present repeatedly, and even in community mental health teams. We've been going on for a little while, and we have not got to Jill yet. Should we continue with splitting, as this seems to be a really important topic and central to the care of patients with BPD and suicidal distress? Well, it does overlap with the first theme of AWARE, which is anxiety and how patients with BPD may create anxiety in professionals they come into contact with. So yes, by all means, we can explore this further. There is always next episode for Jill, if that's where we end up at. So have you got any specific questions that you want to explore further? You mentioned something about childhood trauma. Can you elaborate a little more? So think about it. When a baby enters the world, they experience the things within it as either good or bad, or in other terms, as all or nothing. As the baby develops psychologically, they begin to understand that the world isn't just good or bad. They become able to integrate the idea that good and bad can be held in the same object. So this integration of good and bad in the same person is lacking? If one has experienced childhood trauma and they are really struggling to trust other people, you can see how difficult it is for them to think that a person that they feel close to may have some bad in them along with all the good. That uncertainty is extremely anxiety provoking for someone who has gone through significant trauma. How can good and bad coexist in the same person? This would be way too overwhelming emotionally. So splitting into good or bad allows the person to tolerate difficult and overwhelming emotions by seeing someone as either all good or all bad, idealized or devalued. Yes, this makes it easier to manage the emotions that they are feeling towards another person, 
which on the surface seems to be contradictory as it does put extreme strain on the relationship as it is only a matter of time before the person who is idealized will turn up short. What do you mean by turn up short? Well, a short of their expectations or the expectations that the person with BPD has of them. And then they go from all good to all bad. Such a split might often be caused by an event that might seem harmless or small to people without BPD. But they may in some way relate to previous trauma. The past trauma also creates an entire worldview that it's only a matter of time before the person with BPD, you know, they start believing that they are going to be let down. So people with BPD are often testing out both personal and professional relationships. Again, this testing behavior stems from fears of abandonment, separation, or severe anxiety. And it's only a matter of time that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Can you elaborate on the self-fulfilling prophecy? Say, for example, you're feeling anxious about an upcoming job interview and you start thinking that there's no way I will get the job. You keep ruminating over it and make yourself so anxious that you make a mess of the interview and you don't get the job. And then you say, well, I knew it all along that I wasn't going to get the job. So that's an example of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, but how does that relate to relationships? Let's say you start believing that someone does not like me. So you behave in a way with the person that may be distant or a bit rude. And you know what? The other person notices and they begin to mirror your behavior. And before you know, actually, they don't like you because of the way you have been behaving. But... It feeds into that belief that you had that, ah, they didn't like me to begin with. So again, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, that's much more clearer. But how would you relate that to someone with BPD? Let's say someone with past trauma has started to get close with another person. But because of their past traumatic experiences, they are struggling to open up or trust the person, let them in. So they might start thinking, ah, they are not worth it. They are not lovable enough and they take actions by which they begin to push them away through their actions. You know, these actions that relate to not letting them in. And the person does not persevere and then it feeds into the person's with BPD idea that actually I knew I was not worth it, I was not lovable. And the converse can often be true. So those living with BPD and have had previous trauma They class the person, as I mentioned, as all good and an intense relationship begins. They're all in. Before you know, something happens and doubt creeps in or because of past traumas, they start doubting that this is too good to be true and then they begin testing out their relationship either by being too possessive and some might even use terms like being clingy or putting unrealistic expectations from the person when they are not met. They give rise to arguments and anger outbursts and before you know, they have managed to prove to themselves that this was too good to be true, everyone lets me down, no one should be trusted, all part of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the splitting, all good or all bad, which on the surface makes it easier to deal with relationships, it becomes a huge deterrent to maintaining long-term relationships. Yes, a person with BPD may use splitting to class people as perfect or evil. Something will always or never go right. Something will always or never be loving. A person may hold on to these black and white views permanently. For others, their opposing views can fluctuate over time, where they switch from seeing someone or something as entirely good to entirely bad or vice versa. So is there any other impact for splitting? A common symptom of BPD is emotional dysregulation. This is where a person is less able to manage their emotional responses than individuals who don't struggle with a personality disorder. Therefore, when a person with the disorder splits and perceives something or someone to be entirely good or bad, they are likely to respond in a way that falls outside what would be expected. These extreme emotions can be exhausting both to the person with BPD and those who are closest to them. And this relates to what you were saying about being on a pedestal and coming crashing down? Yes. When seeing someone or something as entirely good, this can leave the person with BPD vulnerable to harm and danger as they are unable to see 
associated risks which may be there in their relationship. So they may get taken advantage of, which then feeds into that cycle of abuse and trauma. Also, when believing a person is completely perfect, this can lead to codependency, where they rely on that individual for all their wants and needs. This can be harmful to both parties and a draining responsibility. And this is what you said, we are all fallible and shades of grey and ash. Yes, when a real or perceived slight is then experienced by the person with borderline personality disorder, this can cause them to feel disappointed, betrayed, unloved or abandoned and view the other party as entirely bad. The individual may become angry or withdraw entirely. They may also become incredibly angry with themselves. There are techniques to manage anger during this time, which is taught in many interventions like dialectical behavior therapy. We also uh, cover this in PROTECT under affect regulation as well. If you are a mental health professional, how do you navigate splitting and continue to care for the person with BPD? I know you mentioned reflective practice and supervision. What will they do in supervision? Well, help the professional get into the person's shoes that's, that's the whole idea of empathy in action. And that is the challenging part. Extremely challenging, particularly when you're working with those with a very severe borderline personality disorder. I'll share one of the most evocative descriptions of what it is like to live a life with severe BPD. A word of caution for our listeners, the response you may have to this is quite visceral. So if you're eating or drinking, either put your food aside or please do not listen to the next minute or so of the podcast. What I'm sharing relates to a discussion about feelings of disgust and how a patient with severe BPD described it, you know, what it felt like to be her and in her shoes. So here goes. What it feels like to be me. Imagine, imagine a dog. A dog has just pooped. The poop is still soft and warm. Using your bare hands, you pick it up and then you open your mouth and you put the poop in your mouth. The way you feel right now, multiply that a hundredfold. That's how it feels like to be me every day. That's the amount of disgust I have towards myself every waking moment. Oh my gosh, that definitely gives a visceral response. Absolutely. Our life experiences are so far removed from those of a person who may have been systematically sexually abused by their primary caregiver from an early age of say five or six. That does not matter how hard we try. It is very difficult, if not impossible, to walk in their shoes. That does not mean we do not try. It means we try harder and harder and suspend all judgment. As we say in the PROTECT training, mind open, mouth shut, listen up. Listen to their pain from up close and personal, close enough to feel their darkness, but not so close that you get overwhelmed yourself. Now, I must say that this is not every person living with borderline personality disorder, their experience. This is the experience that was shared of a unique person who had a very, very traumatic upbringing. So yeah, everyone living with BPD may not relate to what I have just described, but I hope it gets across the sense of the challenge in building up empathy for someone who has gone through that kind of life experience and is living that every single day. You do cover empathy in action in a fair bit of detail in the values of relational safety in the core module, but the scale of this challenge is something quite different. Are there practical things that people, whether they be professionals or family and friends, can remember to do? Remember, firstly, that splitting is a symptom of borderline personality disorder. While it can be difficult not to take their words and actions personally, Remember that the person is not intentionally trying to hurt you. Splitting is something that they are doing unknowingly. Think about how you respond to the person who is splitting. Try to remain calm. And if you find this difficult, 
Give yourself an opportunity to cool down by postponing an important conversation. Show the person that you really do care. A person with BPD is likely to be dealing with feelings of abandonment, isolation and loneliness. Therefore, try to show the person that they are cared for and that they are heard. Set healthy boundaries to help manage behaviors. Work with the person with BPD to set limits so that they understand the behaviors that you won't tolerate or put up with, such as throwing objects or being violent. While these boundaries may be unintentionally challenged at times, make sure that you carry out the predetermined consequences, which may include walking away from the situation. It is also important for you to encourage the person to receive the right treatment and be an advocate of it when they do so. That's quite a helpful summary of how to navigate splitting. I just realized that we've been talking about BPD for so long and we have not even systematically looked at the criterion for diagnosis. You know what? I think we should begin the next episode with those criterion and then I promise we will get around to Jill. It seems like we are endlessly building this up. I do think we have laid a solid foundation though for the BPD case simulation discussion. Understanding splitting is central to caring for people with borderline personality disorder. So this is actually time well spent. Just like episode 20, we never got around to Jill, our case study, as we ran out of time. But we promise to talk about Jill next time and how the where factors relate to Jill. Manon, do you promise as well? I do indeed. We will get there. Patience is a virtue and good things happen to those who wait. I'm sure our listeners realize how important this topic of splitting was. We will look at all the symptoms of borderline personality disorder or emotionally unstable personality disorder in the next episode. In today's episode, we have covered in depth the why, how, and what of splitting and some really evocative imagery of what it feels like to have a severe borderline personality disorder. The strong sentiment of disgust towards oneself will actually relate back to the self-harming that is very prevalent in people with BPD, which we will pick up in the next episode. Pause and think about your clinical practice and what challenges you face with borderline personality disorders. Have you thought of people with BPD as manipulative or attention-seeking? Have your views changed in any way after listening to the podcast? What changes will you make to the interactions you will have with patients with BPD? If you have specific questions, please do email us at admin at progress.guide. Share your musings with us. Tweet your thoughts and tag hashtag guide progress. It helps get the word out about the podcast to more professionals and supports progress to practice. You can access all the transcripts at www.progress.guide. You can connect with Manan on LinkedIn or follow our LinkedIn page by searching on LinkedIn for progress.guide. We are also on Twitter and YouTube. Our Twitter handle is at guide progress. As usual, please do follow the podcast. There'll be weekly episodes every Friday and share it with your colleagues. Your ratings will help get the word out. So please don't forget to rate us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or Audible or whichever channel you're listening on. Challenges in supporting people with borderline personality disorder is a common knowledge and skills deficits. Given severe borderline personality disorder has a standardized mortality rate of 45.1, it is a critical area for suicide prevention. Helping healthcare professionals fine-tune their practice in this area is an essential step in creating a workforce that delivers high quality care for people in suicidal distress. Remember, together we can make a difference. Tune in next Friday and we'll explore how the where factors relate to Jill, our case simulation of borderline personality disorder. Thank you for joining us today and keep spreading the word.